Heavenly Father, thank you for today, and uh, we thank you for the rain. You know, it's been dry for quite a while, and so we pray that this rain would be something that our land needs. Heavenly Father, as we gather as brothers and sisters in Christ to study your word, we are so grateful for the way that you speak to us, for the way that you love us, and for the person that you have sent to us, who is not only a person, he is the very Son of God. We thank you for Jesus, and we pray in his name. Amen. I want to start here with just a uh, sentence and a thought, and the sentence and the thought is this, tragedy takes time. Tragedy takes time. You know, I've been doing a little bit of thinking about some of the great tragedies, some of the uh, great catastrophes of the 20th century, and what I've come to realize as I've thought about those tragedies is that tragedy takes time. I can remember when the uh, movie Titanic came out. Anybody remember the movie Titanic back in the uh, mid-90s? And uh, you guys, of course, maybe remember the story of the Titanic, probably still the greatest maritime disaster of all time. On April 14th, 1912, the Titanic is steaming through the North Atlantic, and it sideswipes an iceberg, and it sinks two hours, 40 minutes later, uh, with the loss of 1,517 people. That's a lot of people to die in a single night. And I can remember when the movie came out, it of course was a blockbuster, a huge hit. And it was kind of interesting because when I watched the movie, they really didn't cover a lot of the history of the Titanic at all. They didn't really tell us why the Titanic was built or how the Titanic was built. Uh, they didn't talk about the plans for the ship, the launching of the ship, the fitting out of the ship, the sea trials of the ship. They just kind of glossed over all of that. And then the ship started sailing across the North Atlantic, and that took a little while. But then once the ship hit the the iceberg in the movie. The real ship took two hours and 40 minutes to sink. In the movie, it took almost two hours to sink. It sank almost in real time. They kind of sped through everything about the history of the ship, the sailing of the ship, a lot of information on the ship, but as soon as they got to the tragedy, everything just kind of slowed down. Because tragedy is one of those things that just takes time. Anybody ever seen the movie Pearl Harbor? You know, the movie's kind of an interesting movie because it has romance and intrigue, but here's what it doesn't have a lot of. It doesn't have a lot of history. The background on how our naval base came to be there, they don't really talk about that. The history of the war up to that point, they don't really talk about that. But as soon as the Japanese come sweeping down in their planes, all of a sudden the movie slows down. In fact, in this movie, if you remember it, a lot of the scenes where the ships are being blown up, those were actually done in slow motion. Because as soon as the tragedy hits, everything slows down because tragedy takes time. Recently, we commemorated the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And uh, you guys know when he died? Anybody remember the day? It was November 22nd. What was the year? 1963, a lot of you know that. Anybody remember his birthday? You know, it's a funny thing. We remember a lot about the death day. We remember a lot about the tragedy. But we don't remember a lot about the rest of his life. When we were commemorating the 50th anniversary of his assassination, a lot of networks ran a lot of specials. But it really wasn't on the life of President Kennedy. It was more on the death of President Kennedy. Everybody focused on that fateful day in Dallas. And there was this inexorable march in all of those specials toward those three fatal shots. Everything slowed down that day. Because tragedy takes time. You know, I've come to the conclusion that the reason that tragedy seems to slow everything down, the reason that tragedy seems to take so much time is because tragedy is kind of like a car wreck, right? You know it's awful, you know it's devastating, you know it's gory, but when you see a wreck, what does everybody do? They, they slow down and they look. Tragedies take time. I'll tell you what, what is true of tragedies in the 20th century? Heck, what is true of tragedies in the 21st century was also true of tragedies in the first century. Tragedies took time. You know, we spend a lot of time studying the life of Jesus, but you know what the gospel writers devote most of their research and most of their writing to? Not the life of Jesus, but the death of Jesus. Because tragedy takes time. Pastor mentioned this in his sermon. He'll mention it again at 11 o'clock if you haven't been yet. Fully one-third of the Gospels are devoted to the final week of Jesus' life. 
Jesus lived on this earth for 33 years. And so 32 years and 51 weeks, uh, those get two-thirds of the Gospels, but then one week gets a full third of the Gospel as Jesus makes his march toward the cross because when that hits, everything slows down. Because tragedy takes time. You know, all this leads me to the series that we're kicking off today. We're going to be doing this series all the way through the season of Lent, both on the weekends and at our midweek services. The title of the series is called Jesus the final days. And the whole idea behind this series is this. The gospel writers, when they get to the final days of Jesus, the final week of his life, the gospel writers slow down. And they focus in on what's going on in Jesus' life, what's going on in Jesus' ministry, and what happens in Jesus' death. And if the gospel writers slow down to really reflect critically on what happens in the greatest tragedy that the world has ever known, maybe we should slow down and think about it too. And that's what this series is all about. It's about kind of pressing the pause button, pressing the slow motion button, and thinking real slowly, real deliberately, and real critically about the final week of Jesus' life, because the final week of Jesus' life matters. It matters not just because it is a tragedy, and it is. It really matters because the tragedy ultimately gives way to triumph. And the triumph is the reason that we still have hope even today. And so this morning as we kick off our series, we're going to start with the final week of Jesus' life and we're going to start on the Sunday before the Friday that Jesus is killed on a cross. And it's interesting because the tragedy of Jesus' final days actually begins with a celebration. It begins with a parade that Jesus takes into the city of Jerusalem. We know it best as, anybody know? Palm Sunday. Let me be talking about Palm Sunday today. The tragedy of the cross begins with a celebration of a parade. You know, this is the way that some tragedies happen, right? They start with a celebration, but then the celebration takes a wrong turn. Uh, Last week, a group of 11 of us went to a conference in Phoenix, Arizona. And the goal of the conference was just to gather different people from different congregations from all over the United States to talk about some of the best practices in their congregations so that we could all learn from each other. And so 11 of us from Concordia went to Phoenix, and we had a great time. It was a great conference. Now, one of the people that went along with us was our executive director, Greg Stiles. And out of all of us who were going to this conference in Phoenix, I think Greg was the the most excited, but it wasn't really because of the conference. It was because his daughter, Reagan, is doing graduate work in Phoenix. And so he was really excited to see his daughter. Not only did Greg go, but his wife, Jennifer, went as well. And so they come along, and they go and spend a little bit of time with Reagan. Greg does some presentations at the conference as well. Now, at the same time that we were in Phoenix, wouldn't you know it, just to add a little extra something to our trip, the San Antonio Spurs just happened to be in Phoenix when we were there too, and they were going to be playing the Phoenix Suns because the rodeo was going on here, and the San Antonio Spurs were on their rodeo road trip. And so Greg's wife, Jennifer, and his daughter, Reagan, they decide, hey, we're going to go see the Spurs play in Phoenix. We're going to root for our hometown team like a 1,000 miles away from our hometown. And the excitement as they went to this basketball game was palpable. They were thrilled. It was going to be a great celebration as we watched the Spurs school the Suns in basketball. And so the two of them, they go off to the game. The rest of us go out to dinner. And about halfway through the dinner, Pastor Tucker is kind of curious about the status and the score of the game. And so I look it up on my SportsCenter app on my iPhone. And with 58 seconds left, the score was, well, yeah. The Spurs were down 22 points. Final score of the game, Suns 106, Spurs 85. It was supposed to be a celebration, but it turned out to be a tragedy. There was a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth that night. It was not good. You know, I wish that all tragedies that began as celebrations involved nothing more than just a few points on a scoreboard. But we know that some tragedies that begin as celebrations are actually a lot more serious. You land a brand new job, and this job has been a long time coming. 
After all, the job market's kind of tough out there. You've been searching for work for months, and now your ship has finally come in. Now you're finally going to be able to get out of the financial doldrums. But as fast as you get that job, you lose that job. Because just a couple of weeks in, the company hits a financial rough spot, and they have to downsize you right out of your future career. And what began as a celebration, you got a new job, wound up as a tragedy. You have a brand new bouncing baby boy. And you're so excited, relatives from all over the country fly in to see your new little bundle of joy. You're all gathered there at the hospital, and you think that everything is great until some of the tests begin to come back a little bit strange. All the tests the doctors run on babies in the hospital, it turns out your bouncing baby boy has some terrible anemia. And, you, and your newborn that you've been holding now for, for a couple of days winds up being ripped from your arms, poked and prodded by doctor after doctor. They're just trying to figure out what to do next. And what begins as a celebration actually winds up being a real tragic trial. You go to a party one night, and you're just there to relax and unwind. Drink a couple of beers, head on home, but one beer leads to two beers, leads to three beers, leads to four beers. And before you know it, you've had way too much to drink. And you know this, you know that you shouldn't get behind the wheel, but you make a bad choice, and you do anyway. And as you're driving down the street, you get into a head-on collision. And the person who was in the car going the right way, because you were going the wrong way, they're pronounced dead on arrival by the paramedics. And what began as a celebration, a night having fun with your friends, winds up being a tragedy. There are some real great celebrations that wind up being some really awful tragedies. And what is true in so many situations and scenarios in our life is true in Jesus' life as well. Because the last week of Jesus' life begins with a celebration, it ends with a tragedy. And this morning, we're going to be looking at that celebration. And we're going to try to figure out what Jesus' celebration can mean for our celebrations. And so our text for today, Matthew 21, beginning at verse 1. If you've got a Bible uh, from the back of the room. It's going to be on page 697. Page 697, Matthew 21, beginning at verse 1. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. Now, I want to pause right there because before the story really gets going, there is a word in verse 1 that clues and cues us into the fact that this story, this celebration is not going to end well. This celebration is actually going to end as a tragedy. And the word that cues and clues us into that is the word Jerusalem. Verse 1 says, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, this word, by this time, in the Gospels, is an ominous word. It is a word that you want to watch out for because it is a word that spells the death of Jesus. Jesus knows the place at which he is going to die is going to be Jerusalem. He has prophesied it. He's forecasted it. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. That's where he's going to die. He's going to die at Jerusalem. Matthew 20, verses 18 and 19. Jesus says to his disciples, we're going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man is going to be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and they will turn him over to the Gentiles to be flogged and crucified. Jerusalem is the place at which Jesus is going to be killed. Jesus knows this, and the disciples know it too. And so the last place the disciples really want to go at this point in time in Jesus' ministry is Jerusalem. Uh, you may remember a story from John 11. One of Jesus' best friends, dearest friends, a guy named Lazarus, dies. And there's Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha are Lazarus' sisters, and they call for Jesus to come to a town called Bethany. You know where Bethany is nearby, like just a few hundred feet? Nearby Jerusalem. And the disciples, they know that Jerusalem is bad news for Jesus by this point in his ministry. And so when Jesus says, okay, it's time for us to go to Jerusalem, the disciples protest. John 11, verse 8, Rabbi, they say, 
A short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going to go back there? The disciples don't want to go anywhere near Jerusalem, but Jesus keeps pressing, and the disciples finally give in, and it's at that point when one of Jesus' favorite disciples, Thomas, John 11, verse 16, finally pipes up and says, all right, let us go that we may die with him. You know, Thomas is not Dale Carnegie, okay? Doesn't really have that positive, optimistic outlook on life. But the disciples know. The disciples know that going to Jerusalem is bad news. Jesus knows it too. But even with the ominous clouds that hang over Jesus' life, even with the danger that this city presents, Jesus goes anyway. And so back to our story, Matthew 21, verse 1, as they approached Jerusalem, And came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and he said to them, go to the village ahead of you. And at once, you will find a donkey that is tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them. And he will send them right away. You know, this little story about Jesus getting the donkey is actually one of my favorite vignettes in the Bible. I love the way that Matthew teases this story out. Uh, Jesus says in verse 2, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anybody says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. And there are two phrases that I want you to pick up on. Uh, One is this phrase, at once. The other is this phrase, right away. In the Greek of the New Testament, they're both the same word. It's the word euthis. And the word euthis in Greek means immediately. And so Jesus says, okay, when you go and you get this donkey, when you go to the donkey rental place, you're going to see the donkeys that you need immediately. And you're going to be able to get the donkeys that you need immediately. You know, kind of an aside here, the Gospel of Mark, this is actually Mark's favorite word. If you read the Gospel of Mark, you'll see the word immediately over and over and over again. A lot of scholars call the Gospel of Mark the action gospel because Jesus does everything immediately. He doesn't waste any time. He teaches immediately. He heals immediately. He travels immediately. He is always on the move in the Gospel of Mark. Well, here, Jesus is on the move to get a donkey, and he's going to get it immediately. You know, when we took our little trip, to Phoenix, one of the things that we needed to do was since there was 11 of us going, we needed to rent some cars. And usually when I rent a car, I rent through Hertz because Hertz has a gold membership. It's pretty sweet. You get there and there's no check-in. You just walk onto the lot and there's, there's your name up here on one of these boards and it, it gives you the spot number that your car is in. You go to that spot. The keys are there waiting for you. You check the car real quick. You drive off the lot. They check you out and you are gone immediately. I love Hertz Gold Club because it's all about getting done immediately. Here's the problem. I I looked on the Hertz website trying to rent a car, and the Hertz website was like $200 more than a a more discount car rental place. And so I thought, $200, yeah, I'm going to go with the discount car rental place. So I do that, and and I get there, and I'm not able to get onto the car lot immediately. I got to go and stand at at the counter, and there's like a 20-minute wait just to see a representative. And then there's another 15-minute filling out of paperwork little transaction that takes place. And then you have to walk uh, several lots to get to this one lot. And then you have to go get the keys. And then that takes a while. And then they have to check you out. By the time that I was done, just picking up my car, it took 50 minutes to get it. Now, the other thing that I need to tell you about this discount car rental place, uh, there were a bunch of fees that weren't really uh, uh, reflected when I rented the car online. You know what those fees finally totaled? About $200. Would you like to know the name of the car rental place? Too bad. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not that mean. You know, my guess is Jesus had to have like the donkey gold rental club card or something. Because he sends his disciples here and they see the donkeys they need immediately. And they get the donkeys they need immediately. It is lightning fast. But here's what I really want you to notice. I want you to notice not just that Jesus' disciples are able to rent the donkeys, but why Jesus' disciples 
are able to rent the donkeys. Matthew says, here's the reason why Jesus' disciples are able to rent the donkeys immediately. Verses 4 and 5 of Matthew 21, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In order to explain why Jesus was able to rent the donkeys immediately, Matthew cites an ancient prophecy. The prophecy is from Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You know, it's interesting, this prophecy from Zechariah 9, verse 9, that Matthew cites here in Matthew 21, was written about 550 years before the story in Matthew 21 takes place. Now, you know what? I will get plane tickets and car rentals a couple of months before I have to go somewhere. Jesus gets everything set up 550 years before he has to go somewhere. Now, that is some serious planning. Now, I actually want to focus in on this prophecy from Zechariah 9, verse 9, uh, because this is a fascinating prophecy. A couple of things that I want you to notice. First thing I want you to notice is that Zechariah's prophecy only mentions one donkey. Zechariah 9, verse 9 says, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, real quick grammar lesson here. The word donkey and the word colt, grammatically, they are in apposition to each other. And the word apposition basically means that the two words refer to the same thing. For example, if I was to tell you, I drive a truck, it is a Chevy. How many vehicles am I talking about? Am I talking about one or two? I'm talking about one. Because the word truck and the word Chevy are in apposition to each other. They describe the same object. I couldn't say that about a Ford because, well, you know how that goes. But I can say that about a Chevy. I drive a truck. It is a Chevy. The Chevy kind of emphasizes the kind of truck that I drive. Well, when the prophet Zechariah says that there's going to be this king who's going to come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, uh, the prophet Zechariah clarifies what kind of donkey it's going to be. It's going to be not just a donkey, but a young donkey. It's going to be not just a donkey, but a colt. Now, here's what's so fascinating about this prophecy from Zechariah. Did you notice that when Jesus actually goes to fulfill the prophecy from Zechariah, he doesn't just get one donkey like Zechariah says? He gets two. When Jesus sends his disciples to the donkey rental place, he says to them, Matthew 21, verse 2, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you're going to find a donkey tied there and a colt. Untie them, plural, Jesus says, and bring them back to me. The prophecy says there's going to be a king with one donkey. Jesus actually goes and gets two donkeys. Now, this just kind of begs the question, why would Jesus do that? Isn't one donkey enough? You know, we actually get a little bit of insight into why Jesus would not only get a, a colt, but also the colt's mom, the donkey. If you read the same story in the Gospel of Mark, Palm Sunday story in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 11, verses 1 and 2. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you're going to find a colt tied there. And then Mark says, this colt is a colt that no one has ever ridden. Now this little phrase here is actually pretty important. Because think about this for just a second. Jesus is fixing to ride a colt into a parade. Probably thousands of people yelling, screaming, getting all excited that Jesus is riding into a major metropolitan area. Here is a colt, and the colt has not been broken. The colt has never been ridden. How well do you think a colt is going to do when it is confronted with thousands of screaming people yelling at this colt? Is the colt going to do real well or not so well? Not so well. Okay, this little parade is going to turn into a rodeo for Jesus. And so what Jesus does to keep the colt calm is he brings the colt's mommy. Now this really teaches us a couple of things about Jesus. 
First thing that it teaches us about Jesus is that Jesus is Lord over creation. Jesus has complete control over creation. He can even keep a cult calm that has never been ridden before, right? And Jesus shows how he's Lord over creation all the way through the Gospels. All Jesus has to do is say a word. And a raging storm on the Sea of Galilee that the disciples think are going to spell their doom is calmed. All Jesus has to do is say a prayer. And five loaves of bread and a couple of fish are turned into not a meager pittance, but into enough food to feed 5,000 hungry mouths. All Jesus has to do is make a declaration. And people are healed of their diseases. Dead people come back to life. Jesus has amazing power over creation. He can deal with storms, food, sickness, and death because Jesus isn't just the Son of God. He's also the creator of the universe. And so if Jesus has this kind of power over creation, how hard do you think it is for Jesus to get a little baby colt to remain calm even in a parade? That's cake. That's no problem. You know, one of the really interesting things the prophets in the Old Testament say about the Messiah is that the Messiah is going to be able to calm creation down. Because we know that a lot of times creation goes crazy, right? That's why we have terrible snowstorms. That's why we have earthquakes. That's why we have hurricanes. That's why we have tornadoes. Creation can go crazy. And yet, the prophets promise that the Messiah is going to be able to calm creation down. Beautiful words from Isaiah 11, beginning at verse 6. Isaiah says that with the Messiah, the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling will be together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They'll neither hurt nor harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord God, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah says that God's anointed, God's Messiah, is going to be able to calm creation down, and this is what Jesus does when he rides in Jerusalem. He calms creation down. That's the first thing you need to know about Jesus. He's the Lord over creation. The other thing you need to know about Jesus is that Jesus really does care for creation. That's why to a little colt that could have been really scared, Jesus actually goes out of his way to get not only the colt, he also gets the colt's mommy because Jesus cares about creation. And if Jesus cares about creation, you know what that means. He cares not only about little colts, He cares about you and me. I love what Martin Luther says about the way that God sustains creation. He says this. Everything must necessarily depend on God. If he doesn't begin it, nothing can exist or come into being. When he ceases, nothing can continue to exist. When God created the world, he did not act as a carpenter does when he builds a house and then departs and leaves it to stand as it may. God remains with his creation, sustaining all things as he has made them. Otherwise, they would neither stand nor stay. Our God and his son, Jesus Christ, they care about creation. They care about you and me. They sustain creation and they sustain you and me. That's why Jesus will say things like Matthew 10, verse 29, not even a sparrow will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. Jesus is totally in tune with everything that happens in creation because he cares about creation. And so Jesus cares about the cult. He brings its mother. He goes riding into Jerusalem. And an amazing parade takes place. Now, there's one other thing that I want you to notice about Zechariah's prophecy in Zechariah 9 verse 9. I want you to notice the context of Zechariah's prophecy. 
Specifically, I want you to notice the verse that comes right before Zechariah 9, verse 9, about the king who's going to come riding into Jerusalem on a colt. Zechariah 9, verse 8, God says, I will defend my house against marauding forces. Never again will there be an oppressor to overrun my people, for I am keeping watch. Right before God says, I'm going to send a king riding on a colt, God says, I'm going to defend my people, my nation, those I love, against marauding forces, against wicked foes. Question for you. When Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on a court, is, is, there, is there a wicked foe that Israel is dealing with? Anybody remember who that wicked foe is? The Romans. And so when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on a colt, the people remember this prophecy from Zechariah 9, verse 9, but they not only remember Zechariah 9, verse 9, they remember Zechariah 9, verse 8, where God says, I'm going to defend my people, my house, my nation against marauding forces. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to knock them down. And here's going to be the sign that I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to knock them down. I'm going to send a king who rides into Jerusalem on a colt. Here comes Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a colt. All the people immediately think, hey, what has Jesus come to do? He's come to knock out the marauding forces. He's come to knock down the Romans. And everybody gets excited. Now, of course, although everybody remembers the verse that comes before Zechariah 9, verse 9, Zechariah 9, verse 8, a lot of the people forget about the verse that comes after Zechariah 9, verse 9, which is Zechariah 9, verse 10 where God says, this king will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Ultimately, the prophet says, this king is not going to come as a warrior. This king is going to come in peace. The people love the war part. They don't so much like the peace part. And so they're waiting for Jesus to kill their enemies. They're waiting for Jesus to wipe out and knock down the Romans. And this actually gives us a little bit of insight into what the people do next. Matthew 21, verse 8. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now here in these verses, three things happen. The people do two things and they say one thing. And I want to cover each of these things. The first thing the crowd does is they spread their cloaks on the road in verse 9. Now, this action is the action of a crowd that believes a new king has been crowned. This is what people would do in the ancient world when a king was coronated. They would spread their cloaks on the road. It was kind of like rolling out the red carpet for a brand new king. Uh, there's this one story from the life of the prophet Elisha in the Old Testament. A new king of Israel, his name is Yehu, is crowned. And when Yehu is crowned and when the people find this out, 2 Kings 9 verse 13 says, They hurried and they took their cloaks and they spread them under him. They blew the trumpet and they shouted, Yehu is king. This is what people do when a new king comes riding into, crowd, into town. They spread their cloaks on a road. Now what's kind of interesting about Yehu is that you know what Yehu does? His first official action as the new king of Israel, you know what it is? He kills people. I'm not making this up. This is Yehu's first official action as the new king of Israel. He kills Israel's enemies. There are two guys who are giving Israel a little bit of trouble. One is named Joram. The other is named Ahaziah. And Yehu kills both of them. 2 Kings 9 verse 24, Yehu drew his bow and he shot Joram between the shoulders. The arrow pierced his heart and he slumped down in his chariot. A couple of verses later, 2 Kings 9 verse 27, when Ahaziah saw what had happened, he fled up the road. Yehu chased him, shouting, kill him too. They wounded him in his chariot. But he escaped to Megiddo, and he died there. 
And so people roll out the red carpet. They spread their cloaks on the road for Yehu. Yehu rides into town. And what does he do? He kills Israel's enemies. Jesus comes riding into town. People spread out their cloaks for him on the road. They roll out the red carpet. What do you think they want Jesus to do? They want Jesus to kill Israel's enemies. Now, that's not the only thing the crowds do. Not only do they roll out the red carpet for Jesus, they also take these palm branches and they wave them for Jesus. Verse 8 says that they cut branches from the trees and they spread them on the road. Now, what's interesting about the palm branches is that the palm branches actually hearken back to a Jewish hero from the 2nd century B.C. His name was Judas Maccabeus. And Judas Maccabeus was a great warrior. The story goes like this. In the 2nd century B.C., the nation of Israel was being oppressed by an evil Greek tyrant. His name was Antiochus IV Epiphanes. There's a bust of his head. And Antiochus IV Epiphanes, his name actually means God made manifest. That's what his name means. Apparently, Antiochus had a bit of an ego problem because he thought he was God come to this earth. Now, the deal with Antiochus was this. Antiochus was a Greek, and he loved Greek culture. He loved Greek clothing. He loved Greek customs. He loved Greek religion. He loved Greek food. I like Greek food too. Antiochus loved it more than I do. And Antiochus IV Epiphanes figured that since he loved Greek culture, everybody else ought to love Greek culture too. Now, you know what is a staple of Greek food? Pork. There's nothing like good old-fashioned pig. It's a delicious meal. Here's the problem. If you're a Jew living in the second century B.C., are you allowed to eat pork? Is that kosher, yes or no? No. Here's Antiochus IV Epiphany saying to all the Jews, hey, you guys need to start eating some pork. Greek food is great. I'm a Greek. You should act like a Greek too. In the 2nd century B.C., the Greeks had a whole pantheon of gods. You probably read them like in high school mythology. Folks like Zeus and Poseidon and Athena. They worshipped all of these different gods who lived up on a mountain called Olympus. Here's the problem. If you're a Jew living in the 2nd century B.C., do you believe in many gods or do you believe in one god? You believe in one god. But here's Antiochus IV Epiphany saying, hey, if I believe in many gods, you need to believe in many gods too. If I worship many gods, you need to worship many gods too. You see, there was a fundamental clash and collision between the culture of Antiochus IV Epiphany, who was the ruler over Israel at this time, and the Jews who were living in Israel at this time. And when Antiochus IV Epiphanes realized that the Jews were going to worship in their way, they were going to eat in their way, and they were not going to become like Antiochus IV Epiphanes, a lover of Greek culture, Antiochus got mad. And he launched an all-out, full-scale persecution against the Jews. There's this one story about these seven brothers. And these seven brothers refused to eat pork. They would not eat some good Greek bacon. Antiochus IV Epiphanes got so mad at these seven brothers that he ordered the brothers' tongues cut out, their scalps cut off, their hands and feet lopped off, and he fried them to death in big pans. True story. Not making that up. That is Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He was an evil, bad, arrogant, depraved man. Now, the Jews thought they were going to be wiped out by him. The Jews thought this was going to spell doom for them until one guy rises through the Jewish ranks named Judas Maccabeus. And Judas Maccabeus leads a revolt against Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And Judas Maccabeus wins. Antiochus IV Epiphanes is beaten back, and the Jews regain their freedom. And when the Jews regain their freedom, they throw a big parade. And we actually have a little bit of historical insight into what that parade looked like. 
Here's what that parade looked like. Bearing ivy-wreathed wands and beautiful branches and fronds of palm, they offered hymns of thanksgiving to him who had given success. Such then was the end of Antiochus, who was called Epiphanes. This is the way that they celebrated Judas Maccabeus' victory over Antiochus IV Epiphanes. They held a big parade for him, and they waved palm branches. In fact, this became so famous that the Jews in their money, you know what they put on their money? A palm branch. It was a way of commemorating and celebrating how Judas Maccabeus saved their nation from an evil tyrant like Antiochus. Now, here's Jesus. He comes riding into town. And what are the people waving? They're waving palm branches. You know why? Because they're hoping that what Judas Maccabeus did with the Greeks, Jesus will be able to do with the Romans. You see, the people want the Romans gone. You know, this celebration isn't so much a party of gladness as much as it is an expectation of military might. Even the song that people sing, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You know, Hosanna in both Hebrew and in Aramaic, it means save now, immediately. The people want Jesus to kick out the Romans immediately. You know, it's interesting, usually when we think of salvation, we think of being saved from what? We think of being saved from our sins. But that's not really the way the people in the first century, the Jews who lived in Israel, thought about salvation. Salvation was not something that primarily happened from from sin. Salvation was something that primarily happened from their oppressors. The Jews didn't walk around saying, hey, we need a Savior to save me from my sin. The Jews walked around and said, hey, we need a Savior to save us from the Romans. They weren't concerned about being saved from their own wickedness. They were concerned about being saved from somebody else's wickedness. You know, I was thinking about this, and I I began to realize that I think in, in a lot of ways, a lot of us do the same thing. There are so many things that we want Jesus to save us from, right? We want Jesus to save us from poverty. We want Jesus to save us from sickness. We want Jesus to save us from difficulty. We want Jesus to save us from the bad traffic on 1604. Little insight into, into my life. I've actually prayed for that before, okay? Please don't let me hit a traffic jam. Please don't let me hit a traffic jam. We want Jesus to save us. But here's the problem. So often we spend so much time asking Jesus to save us from temporal irritations that we forget that what Jesus has really come to save us from is eternal condemnation. And really, folks, what would you rather be saved from? Jesus does not promise to save us from all of the little problems of this life, but he does promise to save us from our sin. And when he makes that promise, that's a promise that leads us to salvation. You know, the people have the song right. They want to be saved. But what they don't understand is that they don't need to be saved from the Romans. They need to be saved from themselves. And so do we. You know, because the crowds do not understand Jesus' salvation, finally and ultimately they don't understand Jesus. Matthew 21, verse 10, the story wraps up when Jesus entered Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred and they asked Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. You know, the crowds 
they know that Jesus is a prophet. But if all you know of Jesus is that he is a prophet, you don't really get Jesus. Because Jesus may be a prophet, but he is much more than a prophet. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. He is God himself who's come to earth in human flesh. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the ruler of the universe. The crowds, they miss all of that. They only get that he's a prophet. They get one thing that Jesus is, but because they don't get everything that Jesus is, they miss all of who Jesus is. Because you can't just pick and choose who you want Jesus to be. You can't take some words about Jesus and say, yeah, I'll take that word, he's a prophet, and leave other words about Jesus like he's the Savior by the roadside. You can have none of Jesus, of who Jesus is, or all of who Jesus is, but you can't have some of who Jesus is. You know, one of my favorite places to go shopping is Half Price Books. Uh, Some of you may probably know this about me. I'm kind of a bibliophile. I love books. I love collecting books. I love reading books. And one of the things that I like about Half Price Books, besides the half price, is that they have such a wide array and variety of books. Some books are serious and scholarly. Others are easy and lighthearted. Others, they're just kind of weird and esoteric. And not that long ago, in kind of the weird and esoteric department, Half Price Books was carrying a book that had this title, Cooking for Your Dog. Now, I have a dog. His name is Bandit. I've talked to you about Bandit before. I love my dog. Cute little black and white shih tzu. Good boy. Loves playing with hope. I do not cook for my dog. Now, if if you're into that kind of thing, that's just totally fine. So they had this book, and it was on proud display at Half Price Books. Now, the other real nice thing about Half Price Books, of course, is that you always know exactly what the price of the book is, right? Because they have these little yellow price stickers that are right there on the front of the book so that you know immediately, hey, is this book worth my however, you know, a couple of dollars that it cost me? Or is this just a book that I need to just leave right there on the shelf? And so this was the display at Half Price Books. Cooking, what's that second word? Your dog. (laughs) Now this book just got significantly more interesting to me. Now, it's interesting because almost everything is there except for one key thing. And when you miss that one key thing, you miss everything this book is about. The crowds, when they hail Jesus as the Messiah, when they hail Jesus as a prophet, when they hail Jesus as a king who's coming riding into Jerusalem, almost everything is there. But they miss the key thing about Jesus. And when they miss the key thing, they miss everything. You can have all of Jesus or you can have none of Jesus, but you can't just have some of Jesus. When they forget that he is a savior from from sin, when they refuse to hail him as the son of God who's come into this world, They miss everything Jesus has come to do. You know, it's interesting. When the crowd comes to meet Jesus on Palm Sunday, Matthew uses kind of a fascinating word to describe the celebration. He says, when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem, Matthew 21, verse 10, the whole city was stirred. Greek word here is the word seo. And this is a word of anticipation. This kind of gives a sense as if the air in Jerusalem is electric. People can't stand still. They can't sit still. They are so excited that Jesus has come riding into town. Seo is a party word. This describes the excitement, the joy, the jubilee of Palm Sunday. This one little word, seo. Now, what's so interesting about this word is that this one little word actually pops up just a couple of chapters later in Matthew 27. Verse 50, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. 
At that the moment, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook. Greek word there for shook is the word seo. You know, it's so interesting. The people have their party when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But creation has its party when Jesus stretches out his arms on a cross and dies. Because even if the people don't get it, creation does. The real party is not on a donkey. The real party is not with some palms. The real party is not with some cloaks spread on a road. The real party is not with crowds crying Hosanna. Because that is not when salvation happens. The real party is on the cross. Because even though it's a tragic thing, it's a terrific thing. Because the cross is where salvation happens. The cross is where sin and death and the devil are defeated. And Concordia, that is worth a party. Creation gets it. And so it sails. How about you? Do you get it? Do you say, oh, do you party? Because the cross looks like a tragedy, but it's really a triumph. And if that isn't worth a celebration, I don't know what is. Because that's not just a celebration, that is salvation. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, We thank you for your son Jesus, and as we look at a week that begins with the celebration, we know that the best of the celebration is yet to come, because the best of the celebration is not with palms and a donkey and with crowds. The best of the celebration is with a cross and with an empty tomb. Heavenly Father, we know that it's there that the real celebration begins, because we know that it's there that our salvation is won. May that be something that we celebrate not just during the season of Lent but each and every day of our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a great week, guys. Walk with light.